This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. Both the Old and New Testament have a lot to say about heaven. The descriptions of God, Jesus Christ, and a great holy host described in the book of Revelation chapters 4 and 5 provides incredible insight into the very realm of God and His spirit dimension. But what about those scriptures mentioning mankind being in heaven? Can we really expect to be there too? Is heaven the place where humanity will actually go to be with God? And in particular, what does the Bible say about this? Does it really promise heaven to be the place? Stay with us as we explore these questions on today's edition of the Armor of God. In times like these, we need the Armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Mike James. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Armor of God. We're glad you could join us for today's program. What we're going to talk about today is heaven. Now many Christians believe that they go to heaven when they die. Those of us who are with the Church of God International do not believe that. We believe the pages of your Bible reveal that when you die you are asleep until a future resurrection. There are other Christians that believe that at Christ's second coming, they will be wafted off into heaven. Once again, we don't believe that. We believe that when Christ comes the second time, He's going to meet His followers in the air and come back to the earth and set up His kingdom upon this earth right then and there. There's not going to be a three and a half year period in heaven or a seven year period in heaven or any other period in heaven where Christ's followers go there and then return to this earth. Now, we're going to look at that question today, and specifically we're going to deal with the aspect of it that deals with Christ's second coming and what occurs for his followers when Christ returns the second time. Now, many of you have probably heard of this concept of the rapture, and if you look at the history of the rapture, it doesn't go back to the beginning of Christianity. If you study the beginning of Christianity, you will see early Christians believed in a literal kingdom of God upon this earth. The idea of a rapture in that very term came about in the 1800s, around 1830 specifically, by a fellow named John Nelson Darby. Now, John Nelson Darby was a member of the Plymouth Brethren, and there were a couple women, a few women in his congregation, who began to have visions of this rapture, this rapture that was going to take believers to heaven for a period of time before they were going to return to this earth. So we want to look at, does the Bible really say that? And I will tell you that I don't believe that it does say that. But if it doesn't say that, why do these folks have those ideas? Because there are a lot of evangelical Christians out there today who believe in this idea of a rapture. There are a series of books called the Left Behind series that have sold millions of copies. And people have a real far conception in this particular view. Is it true or not? What does the Bible say? We're going to look at that today. Now, before, before we go any further in today's program, what we'd like to do is offer you some free literature and also some free CDs that pertain to this particular subject. What we'd like to offer you today is the booklet, Should You Expect a Secret Rapture? No question about it, the Bible definitely teaches that the saints will be caught up to meet Christ at His coming. But will this momentous event take place when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords visibly descends from heaven with power and great glory? Or will it occur several years earlier? Get this booklet to find out more. We also want to offer you a full sermon CD titled, 
going to heaven, question mark, and the delusion of a rapture. Both of these CDs are sermons that relate to this interesting topic. To get all three of these items free of charge, all you need to do is call toll-free 1-888-578-8791. That's 1-888-578-8791. Or you can visit our website to order www.cgi.org. That's www.cgi.org. Org. You can also go to our website to learn more about our weekly sermon broadcast. Go to www.cgi.org. Thanks again for joining us on this edition of the Armor of God. As we said at the top of the program, what we're specifically going to look at today is what occurs at Christ's second coming. Do the believers who follow Jesus Christ meet Him in the air and then go back to heaven with Him for a three and a half year period, a seven year period? There are even others who take you back to heaven for a shorter period of time. Or at Christ's second coming, when He meets His followers in the air, do they come back to this earth and begin to reign and rule in that kingdom on earth? Well, those of us with the Church of God International believe that when Christ comes the second time, He comes back to this earth after meeting His followers in the air and sets up His kingdom on earth and begins to reign and rule. But why are there these other ideas out there and how can we look at Scripture to try to resolve some of the conflict that there is on this particular topic? That's what we're going to try to do today. Now to do so, what we need to do is we need to take a look at some scriptures that deal with the topic of Christ's second coming. And there are some significant scriptures in the New Testament that address this topic. One of the most significant is Matthew chapter 24. Now we won't be able to read Matthew chapter 24 completely today, but I want to pull a few verses from Matthew 24 to comment on to look at this idea of a rapture or of a going to heaven, and is that really being said in Matthew 24? I submit to you that you won't find it anywhere in Matthew 24, and I'll ask you to go ahead and read that when you have a chance and convince yourself about that. But notice in Matthew 24 and verse 3, let's get the context of what's being discussed here. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's no doubt about it. What Jesus is about to talk about in Matthew 24 has to deal with His second coming. So we better pay close attention to this and see if we can find any mentioning here of His followers going to heaven. And I submit to you it is not there. But notice what is there. Notice what is there in Matthew 24. In verse 22 it says this, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now just think about this concept of a rapture to heaven. Now if you're in heaven, you're, you're obviously safe, right? And you're a believer in Christ. So why put in this verse here that if he didn't shorten those days at the end, that no flesh would be saved, and for the elect's sake, he's going to shorten this suffering. It, it wouldn't make sense if he's going to waft us all the way to heaven. Now, there's, they, the others could argue on this and say, well, some believers will be on earth and they will begin to believe because of all the terrible things happening on earth. But why doesn't it say that within Matthew 24? Interesting that, it, that it's not there. But notice what else is there in Matthew 24. I'm going to pick it up now in verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now at the second coming, it says everybody's going to know about it. 
there's going to be no doubt that Jesus has come back the second time. So how is this, as some call it, a secret rapture? Because there are some proponents of this view who say it's going to be a secret rapture, that only the believers are going to know about it. But this is telling us that everybody's going to know when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth. Another scripture in Matthew 24 is verse 31. It says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, the heaven that is being referred to here is merely the atmosphere where you see clouds and things of that nature. There are three heavens referred to in your Bible. The heaven of our atmosphere, the heaven of outer space, and the third heaven where God resides. But this particular heaven where we are taken up to meet him in the air is the atmospheric heaven that you see around you. So we definitely do meet him in that heaven, which is the atmospheric heaven. But as we can tell from other scriptures in your Bible, which make it very clear, we come right back to this earth. And you can read Zechariah to find proof of that. And some of the other prophets talk about that very fact. But notice what else we find here in Matthew chapter 24. And notice thus far we haven't found this rapture concept, or, or not even the word rapture is there. I want to point your attention to something else here in Matthew 24. Notice verse 46, thinking about this concept of a rapture. In Matthew 24, 46, it reads like this, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Just listen to the language. When the Lord cometh. It says nothing about us coming or going anywhere. It talks about the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming. And it's hoping that we're going to be doing what we should be doing upon this earth when he returns. Think of all his parables. They talk about a man going away from some people and then coming back to those people. Over and over, Jesus' parables make that language clear that he's going away and he's coming back. Never that those that he left are going to leave their place and go to him. And the same thing's true here in Matthew chapter 24. Notice verse 48 of Matthew 24. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. So once again, his coming. He's the one who's doing the movement. He's the one who's making the action and coming to us. Notice verse 43 of Matthew 24. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Think of this, your house to be broken up. Your house is the place you're secure, the place you're familiar with. That's the earth for us. And who is this thief? referred to here in Matthew 24. Well, the Bible explains to us who that particular individual is. I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles handy, to Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to pick it up there in verse 15 of Revelation 16. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Once again, that whole concept, the language that's used in Matthew 24, similar to Jesus' parables, similar to what we're reading here in Revelation, He's making the action, coming to us, being with us. We are not going to go to Him other than to meet Him in the air, which is still within the environs of planet Earth. 
Now, I want you to think about something else. Turn with me to another scripture that relates to this second coming. And ladies and gentlemen, you've got to look at all the scriptures that relate to the second coming. And I had someone tell me the other day that you can't let Revelation explain the rest of the Bible to you. You've got to let the rest of the Bible explain Revelation to you. And I'm going to get to the reason I say that in a moment. But notice this other scripture that relates to the second coming. It's over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Talking about the same time frame, folks. For one they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So it's very clear this is once again talking about his second coming. What's going to happen? But where do we see anywhere the mention of going to heaven and being with the Lord in the third heaven for any period of time? Why do we go through scripture after scripture? All of Matthew 24. Go to Luke chapter 17, ladies and gentlemen. It also talks about the time of the end and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Read all of Luke 17, and nowhere in Luke 17 will you find any information about this rapture concept. Go to Mark chapter 13. Once again, it reiterates what we were talking about in Matthew 24. It reiterates what is in Luke 17, and again, there's no mention of the word rapture. There's no mention of people going to heaven to be with God for any length of time. Over and over, as you look at different scriptures in the New Testament that relate to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the book is silent on people going to heaven to be with Jesus Christ. The record of your Bible states Jesus is coming to this earth to be with us. Now, if that is true, where does this idea come from and why do people continue to hold on to this idea? Well, that's going to bring us to the book of Revelation, ladies and gentlemen. And before we get into some of the scriptures that have some people believing in this concept of going to heaven and being with God, we need to understand some things about Revelation in this particular study today. The book of Revelation is a vision. And I want you to look up the word vision in your dictionaries at home. A vision is not reality. It could be a picture of some elements of reality, but it is not reality like what you're experiencing as you walk through the day. I want to give you some language in relation to this. If you turn with me in, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up there in verse 9 of Revelation 1, listen to how John begins to write about this apocalyptic scene that he's about to see. Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. So John's telling you how this all got started. He's on the Isle of Patmos, so that's historical. He was there, and he's about to see something. What's he about to see, though? He's about to see a vision, ladies and gentlemen, 
And again, remember what your dictionaries say about a vision. It is not necessarily reality. It is something that is going to occur in the future. It is a dream-like sequence. It is a trance-like state in which you are experiencing something that is not reality. Now, I want to caution us with, with that that there are things in Revelation that are really going to happen, but it is a highly symbolic book. Let me quote you from the NIV Study Bible. Revelation is apocalyptic, a kind of writing that is highly symbolic. Now, whenever you're dealing with symbols, you need to be very careful that you understand those symbols. So that's why we have to go to other scriptures like Matthew 24, Luke 17, Mark 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, to help us understand what we're reading in Revelation. We even have to go to the prophets of the Old Testament to help us understand what we're reading in the book of Revelation. And if you don't have a good knowledge of all the rest of the Bible, it's very difficult to understand what is going on in the book of Revelation. Now just to provide further proof that the book of Revelation is a vision, I want you to turn with me over to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 17 and let's let the writer tell you himself. Revelation 9 and verse 17, and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them. This is John writing about this vision that he's seeing and all this symbology that is right before him as he writes about what God is giving him in this particular vision. Now, let's begin to look at some of the scriptures in Revelation that people believe are saying that people are in heaven with God. One of these scriptures that they use is in Revelation 15, and I'd like to read it to you. Here's what it says, Revelation 15 in verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now catch this, verse 2. And I saw, now, now get that, he saw something in heaven in his vision. All right, remember what a vision is. And then in, chap in verse 2 he says, and I saw. Now I submit to you, whatever he sees here in verse 2, are we convinced that it is in heaven? I'm not convinced of that from the way it's written, and here's why. As you drop down to verse 5 of the same chapter, notice how he writes, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So it seems like when he's looking at heaven, he lets you know that it's heaven. Because what those who believe in a rapture believe is that when you read verse 2 about, let me read it to you, verse 2, chapter 15 of Revelation, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. They believe these are people who've made it out of the great tribulation and now have salvation. But once again, folks, the Bible doesn't literally say that, and we need to be careful in how we understand symbols. There's no doubt that this is alluding to people who are Christians who are going to be saved, but what does the rest of the Bible tell us about salvation? You meet the Lord in the air, and you come back to this earth. So we need to be careful when we get into all these symbols in Revelation as to how we interpret and understand them. Now let me show you something else over in Revelation 7 and verse 9. It says in Revelation 7 and 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. 
wow, this sounds like a great scene. Let's drop down to verse 14, same chapter. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Sounds like a great scene. What the rapture theorists say is, this is a scene from heaven. But ladies and gentlemen, hold on one moment. Is this a scene from heaven? Does it say that the throne of God here is in heaven? And they'll say, well, we're in Revelation chapter 7, and that's before Revelation 19 when Jesus comes the second time. So this must be a, a heavenly scene. But ladies and gentlemen, if you study commentaries on Revelation, it's not a chronological work. In fact, when you study the prophets, this scene that's being described here, ladies and gentlemen, is a kingdom of God scene. And where do the prophets say the kingdom of God will be? They see it will be upon the earth. And listen to what Jeremiah 3.17 says about that throne we just read about in Revelation. Jeremiah 3.17, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. I submit to you that what you're reading there in Revelation 7 is what Jeremiah the prophet is talking about, the kingdom of God upon the earth and all the peoples who have been saved coming before that king in that kingdom. Kingdom. There are many other scriptures like this that we can explain to you, and we do that in that CD that we're offering today, which is titled, Are We Going to Heaven? Question mark. Ladies and gentlemen, please get that CD. Please get that booklet on the rapture and get the other CD that we're offering today, which addresses the rapture idea. We want you to get all of this free of charge by calling 1-888-578-8791. That number is 1-888-578-8791. Or visit our website to order, www.cgi.org. That's www.cgi.org. Please get the CD, The Delusion of a Rapture. Get the CD, Going to Heaven. Get the booklet, Should You Expect a CD secret rapture. Learn what your Bible really says on these important points and topics that relate to the biblical record and what it really says. Ladies and gentlemen, there is not a secret rapture. Jesus Christ, our soon coming King, is going to meet his believers in the air and he's coming back to this earth. Be part of it, folks. I want to thank you for joining us today. Please put on the whole armor of God. We'll see you again another time. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.